Good afternoon or good day. Uh, I'm Brent Bauer. I'm a general internist here at Mayo Clinic. I'm the director of our complementary and integrative medicine program and I'm here to share a few thoughts about our recent paper on over-the-counter enzyme supplements. Now you may be wondering why we would spend time worrying about over-the-counter enzyme supplements. Well in fact if you think about the broad range of dietary supplements this has become part of our health care in the United States. We now have pretty good studies including several done here at Mayo Clinic that suggest about 60 percent of our patients are using something in the realm of dietary supplements. Over-the-counter enzymes happen to be one part of that. But once we understand that our patients are using these supplements then it behooves us as physicians and care providers to have some understanding of where the risks, the benefits, and then how do we advise our patients. There's an act called Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act of 1994 and that actually created this category called dietary supplements and really they don't fall under the drug uh, regime or the regimen or the oversight and they don't really fall under the food. It's a very unique category and that act specifically exempts these supplements from having to be shown to be safe or effective. The other thing we have to think a little bit about is purity. So wh whether we're talking about enzyme supplements or an herb like ginkgo or a vitamin like vitamin D, the uh, quality of the product, at least until recently, was often suspect. A lot of these supplements did not have good oversight and a lot of things reached the shelves that were tainted or did not have the ingredients they stated. Good news in that regard, 2010, the FDA implemented something called GMPs, good manufacturing practices. And that does mean now that if a supplement's manufactured or sold in the United States, it's supposed to have kind of a cradle to grave approach. We're supposed to be able to show how it was harvested and identified, how it was processed, and how that processing ensured that there weren't insecticides or pesticides, and what ends up in the bottle is actually what's on the label. So that's a nice change from what was true just a few years ago where a lot of things reached the shelves that weren't so good. Now why would we take time to look at enzyme supplements? Well it turns out these become very popular. Sales have just been growing, growing, growing. Largely I think around three main indications. They've been touted as being helpful for aiding digestion, uh, helping with osteoarthritis or other inflammatory conditions, and as an anti-cancer agent or something to take during cancer treatment to try and improve symptoms and overall quality of life. So like a lot of other supplements, there's probably a grain of truth in each of those uh, claims. We know, for example, that we do use prescription uh, enzyme replacements for po folks who've had severe pancreatitis or have lost pancreatic function or cystic fibrosis. So we're familiar with those uses. What our patients are hearing about, however, with the over-the-counter supplements like bromelain, papain, uh, trypsin, chymotrypsin, uh, these are ones that are being touted that if you have some digestive issues, let's say you have some gas or bloating, uh, the story is that as we age our enzymes decrease and so we need to supplement. So if we take extra enzyme supplements, it'll help our digestion. The trouble from a scientific standpoint is we don't have any good studies. Uh, there's one small study looking at patients who had a prescription uh, enzyme replacement and it seemed to help improve digestion of a fatty meal. But It was one small trial, it was an open label, and we really can't use that to justify the use of dietary supplements, uh, enzyme supplements, for general nutrition or general digestion. Now having said that, do I have some patients who use over-the-counter enzyme supplements and see improvement in their digestion? And the answer is yes. And so that becomes a question for those individuals, how much evidence do we need versus how much risk is there? And sometimes if the risk isn't too high and the evidence isn't too high, but the patient's finding benefit, I think we can take a permissive attitude, not endorsing the use or recommending the use, but by the same token, probably not having to uh, vociferously push back on their use. Now why would enzymes help people with osteoarthritis? Well that's a very good question. There's some preclinical trial data that suggests enzymes like bromelain can be anti-inflammatory. And again a lot of debate because most of these large enzyme molecules aren't thought to survive the trip through the GI tract and so how could they go on to have a systemic effect? There's debate about that but again we can go to one small trial a proprietary product that contains bromelain, rutin, and trypsin. Uh, and that particular enzyme product in a small study, about 75 folks with osteoarthritis of the knee, did seem to suggest uh, equivalent function or equivalent efficacy in terms of pain control 
as diclofenac, a prescription medication often used for osteoarthritis. Now, can one study make a definitive statement about the role of bromelain and, and similar agents? Of course not. Uh, but what we do get is we get a clue that maybe some of that preclinical data suggesting anti-inflammatory effect may be something there. One small trial doesn't mean we can endorse it or use it, but it does mean we can at least pay attention and hope for the next studies to come out and give us more information. So what happens if my patient has osteoarthritis and says, I've heard about that product, I want to use it? Then our question becomes next, well, what are the risks? And I think they're pretty limited for the most part if the doses are kept within uh, the manufacturer's recommendations. We know that if uh, bromelain may have some anticoagulant or at least antiplatelet activity, so combining it with antiplatelet agents or other anticoagulant medications at least theoretically could increase the risk of bleeding. I don't think that's been reported clinically, but it's one of those things that I think we should think about and try and steer our patients who are on anticoagulant drugs away from the use of agents like bromelain. There is one well-recognized uh, side effect of prescription supplements, and that's in children with cystic fibrosis. Uh, children with cystic fibrosis can develop something called fibrosin colonopathy when they use dietary uh, or uh, prescription enzyme supplementation. Now, it hasn't been reported with over-the-counter enzymes, but again, this would be one of those situations where for sure we want to tell our patients who are younger, have cystic fibrosis, they should not experiment or try uh, over-the-counter enzyme supplements. So again, would I endorse my patient to use uh, a bromelain product to try and treat their osteoarthritis? I think the answer to that is no. That third realm, where a lot of the um, websites and a lot of the advertising comes, is that enzymes will help either treat cancer or prevent cancer. And again, if we look at some of the effects, uh, some of these enzymes do have an anti-inflammatory effect. Some, in the test tube, have at least what we would consider anti-cancer activity. So it's not without a grain of truth, but then we have to come back and ask the hard question. Do we have good studies that show that taking a dietary enzyme supplement on a regular basis can either prevent or treat cancer? And there we have to just say, no, there's no evidence to that effect. And say, let's back up the train before you take any supplements. How are you doing with diet? How are you doing with exercise? What is your stress management program? And how do you stay connected to the people that bring meaning to your life, whether it's family, friends, church, synagogue? We know from good studies, uh, Dr. Dean Ornish in 2013 published a nice study on telomere length, suggesting that that kind of lifestyle approach can actually affect us at a chromosomal level in a positive uh, fashion. Now from that point, then we can ask in a very targeted fashion, what symptoms or issues do you still have? And from that we can then say, okay, this may have enough evidence that we could try supplement A, B, or C. But I think that becomes a, a, a little more of a dialogue and a little more of a shared give and take with our patients. But in the long run, I think we're helping our patients make informed decisions. We hope you found this presentation from the content of Mayo Clinic Proceedings valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our homepage is www.mayocliniceproceedings.org. There you will find access information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.com. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.